So the heat equation is a differential equation that when you solve it, you can derive temperature profiles or temperature distributions in a stationary medium. So typically a solid, but there might be instances where a fluid is totally stationary and you can only account for conduction and neglect any convection that might be happening due to bulk fluid motion. So the heat equation is derived by applying conservation of energy to a differential control volume. So again, you just you define a control volume and then you do an energy balance over that control volume. So in the case of Cartesian coordinates, you'll have energy flowing in and out in the x direction. You have energy flowing in and out in the y direction. You have energy flowing in and out in the z direction. And that gives rise to each of these individual terms. You can also have a volumetric generation term. And ultimately, in minus out plus generation is equal to accumulation. So the heat equation can quite effectively describe how these temperature profiles are changing, not just with respect to their spatial dimensions, but also, also with respect to time. When you're dealing with radial systems, the heat equation takes on a little bit of a different form, and this is due to heat encountering um, as, it, as heat propagates out radially it's encountering a different size of cross-sectional area as it propagates out. So you have to account for that when you're doing this differential control volume balance. And that gives rise to these terms, 1 over r and 1 over r squared, which is also due to the description of Fourier's law um, to, to characterize conduction in a radial system. Similarly, in a system with spherical coordinates, it gets even a little bit more complicated where now you get these sine terms in there, but the good news is that you can t typically the convenience of a spherical coordinate system is done so that you can reduce this to a one-dimensional system. Where if you're looking at a sphere, you, if you can make the assumption that whatever is happening at the boundary is happening uniformly, then you can neglect temperature variations with respect to these angles phi and theta. So in this particular case, if we can assume that temperature only varies radially, then this term is zero and this term is zero. So we can totally neglect those terms. And we're just dealing with temperature variation in the R direction or radially. So here are a couple of thought problems. So you typically, if you're using this heat equation method, you can start with the full rigorous form of the heat equation which for cylindrical coordinates is shown at the bottom of this slide. But then you can make simplifying assumptions. So in this case, a long concrete cylinder is heated by an electrical wire running axially, axially down its center. But it's, it only has that wire on one end. So how many dimensions, i.e. spatial coordinate variables, should be used to represent this system? And I'll give you just 10 seconds to stop while you're watching the video and think about this. All right, so in this particular system, we have uneven heating. So we're gonna get higher temperatures here and lower temperatures here. So that means we're going to expect temperature variations in this direction, which is the axial direction denoted by Z. So this term is going to be important. DT, DZ cannot be zero. Radially, we would also expect temperature, di um, temperature differences as we're going out from the center of this thing where it's likely to be hotter than toward the edges. So dt dr will be a non-zero number. However, there's nothing given to us in the problem statements that suggests that temperature var will vary angularly throughout this thing. Um, this wire is right at the center, so we expect heat to propagate out uniformly in the radial direction. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't vary from one point on the surface to another point on the surface, given the same radius and the same distance axially. So that means dt d phi will be zero, meaning there's no temperature variation in with respect to phi, whereas phi would be defined as, sorry, I'll try to make this a little bit more clear. Phi would be defined as the angle going in this direction. Again, um, we might want to represent generation 
especially where the wire is actually running. So we might have generation, but only in specific parts of our system. And another simplifying thing you can do is if you're only looking at the system at steady state, then you don't need to worry about the accumulation. But if your problem specifies maybe you're an engineer and you want to know how long it's going to take for a certain part of this rod to, to heat up to a certain temperature, then you'd want to consider the dynamics. But if you're just doing steady state analysis, you can neglect this term as well. So you're, at steady state, you'd only be considering these two different terms. Okay, so here's another interactive problem. A hot metal sphere at a uniform initial temperature of 500 Kelvin is dropped into a tank of a cooler quench oil at a uniform constant temperature of 280 Kelvin. So at time t equals 30 seconds, we would like to determine the temperature distribution in the sphere. How many dimensions should you use to model this system? Okay, so an important assumption to make is that eventually the sphere is going to sit on the bottom and we, we might just want to neglect what's happening there because that could actually get quite complicated. So if we just assume that the sphere is has convection happening uniformly at its surface where it's losing heat uniformly, there's really no reason to think that there is any angular dependence on temperature at all, which allows us to totally neglect temperature variations with respect to phi and temperature variations with, with respect to theta. And there's nothing in this problem that tells us that generation is happening, but we probably are interested in changes with temperature over time, especially at this very short time scale when we're going from 500 Kelvin to being exposed to a temperature of 280 Kelvin and we're only looking 30 seconds out. So we probably want to know how that temperature profile evolves with respect to time and then we'd be looking at temperature variations with respect to the sphere's radius. So the problem does get quite a bit simpler by neglecting these different terms. So here's another form of the heat equation. This is in Cartesian coordinates and this is applying certain assumptions. So it's only looking at one dimensional conduction, which means in Cartesian coordinates, we only care about the X dimension. So we're assuming that temperature doesn't vary in the Y or Z directions. In a planar medium, so if it's just heat propagating through a wall, and if it has constant properties um, and no generation, and actually this can get a little bit simpler. So constant properties refers to these properties, including the thermal conductivity. So if thermal conductivity is constant and is not a function of temperature or something else, then you can actually pull this conductivity outside of the derivative. It's just a constant, so it doesn't matter if it's in those parentheses or not. And we'd get something that looks like this. So K times the second derivative of temperature with respect to X is equal to rho Cp times the first derivative of temperature with respect to time. So that equation simplifies. And to make it even more simple, this term, the thermal diffusivity is defined. So the thermal diffusivity is just K over rho Cp. And the thermal diffusivity is a really good measure of how fast heat is going to propagate through a medium. So if the medium has a lower heat capacity or a lower density, alpha, the thermal diffusivity gets a lot bigger and your temperature profile is going to reach a steady state a lot faster. Similarly for thermal conductivity, if it's a very conductive material, it's going to have a tendency to, heat's going to propagate through very quickly and that um, the temperature will change very rapidly until it reaches a steady state. An important thing to consider with the heat equation, so our initial conditions and boundary conditions. So initial conditions are relevant when that dt by dt term is not neglected. So you're, you're concerned about the dynamics of your system. You want to know how long it takes to go from one temperature to another, for example. So when you're solving the heat equation and you have that change in temperature with respect to time term in your heat equation, you're going to need to know what the initial conditions are. And because we're considering space also, you'll need to define initial condition throughout the whole material. Also there are boundary conditions. The heat equation is a second order partial differential equation, which means 
you'll need to do two integrations. So you're, you're going to need two boundary conditions each time you're using the, the heat equation. So some common cases of boundary conditions would be the surface temperature is held constant, or you have some constant heat flux at the surface. You might have a convection boundary condition, which still implies heat flux going through your surface, but it's going to be a function of the bulk fluid temperature and the surface temperature. So as the surface temperature changes over time, the amount of flux going into it will also change. So at that boundary node, you can do things like equate the amount of energy um, that's propagating through by conduction in, in your solid to the amount of energy that's convected through at that solid to fluid interface. And finally, the last type of boundary condition is an insulated surface where no heat is going through, which means that your temperature profile is going to be flat immediately at the wall or immediately at the boundary because there's no flux. So when there's no flux by Fourier's law, um, the temperature derivative with respect to your spatial coordinate must be zero. So let's go back to our example problems and talk about boundary conditions. So a boundary condition in this case would probably be, one of them would be convection. So you'd certainly have convection going from the surface of the sphere out into the oil. But remember, we need two boundary conditions. So really, convection sort of applies to this whole outer boundary. And actually, another boundary condition can be right at the center, there is no flux. So I mentioned that you can use a no-flux boundary condition when you have an insulated surface, but you can also use it when you have a symmetrical surface. So right at the center of this, if we're trying to plot, let's say this is R and this is minus R, you might have a temperature profile that looks something like this at some point. So right there, right at the center where R equals zero, that derivative is going to be flat. Heat is not going to be crossing that particular boundary because it's the same temperature on each side, so there's no driving force for heat transfer. So that's just one example of a, a boundary condition. And remember, when you're solving the heat equation, you're always going to need two boundary conditions. And you'll find that when you start to integrate, um, when you start to integrate the equation, you'll need to find two constants of integration, which will necessitate two boundary conditions. And throughout the class, we're going to have lots of examples, lots of practice doing this. So it just takes, it takes time solving these types of problems. So back in the case of the sphere, you're going to have boundary conditions. And here we're dealing with two dimensions. So you're actually going to need four boundary conditions. But radially, you might have a convection boundary condition happening here. And you're going to have a no flux boundary condition happening here at this interface. When you're looking at axially, axially you're going to have a boundary condition here. So this might be convection. And you're going to have a boundary condition here. So let's say this side of this rod is insulated. So here you have a no flux boundary condition. So because there are two dimensions here, we need two boundary conditions for each dimension to solve this problem. So again, those are the different types of boundary conditions. So thermal conductivity, these are just some definitions of thermal conductivity. The textbook that goes with this course has, has really good tables that describe the thermal conductivity. And as you might expect, metals have a high thermal conductivity. Gases have a pretty low thermal conductivity. And there's all kinds of materials in between. So you can typically look up all the different properties, including thermal conductivity or thermal diffusivity. You can find density and heat capacity by um, looking in the tables in Appendix A, and specifically um, for solids, they're in table A1 through A3, and you can just read them right there. Thermal conductivity m is typically treated as a constant, but there might be special cases where thermal conductivity can actually vary. If there's an interesting crystal lattice, for example, the physical structure might be different in one dimension or the other, so that's going to cause the thermal conductivity to actually be different. So in this particular case of this quartz crystal, you can see there's a very different crystal structure in this direction versus this direction. So you might actually find that the thermal conductivity in one direction does not equal the thermal conductivity in another direction. And you just have to account for those kind of things 
and hopefully come up with some sort of relationship for how the thermal conductivity changes in, in each direction. Thermal conductivity can also be a function of temperature. So here is how thermal conductivity changes with respect to temperature for different materials. So in a lot of cases, um, you can see it's, it's pretty flat and it's probably a pretty decent assumption to just assume that the thermal conductivity is the same. But in some cases, like with fused quartz, you can see actually a pretty dramatic change in thermal conductivity. So one way to approach this would actually be, would be to come up with some sort of functional relationship, as in K as a function of temperature is equal to, I don't know, A plus B times T squared, for example. So you could actually, when you're integrating the heat equation, you could substitute in this functional relationship into the heat equation and making sure that you're integrating with temperature um, as you solve the equation.